And now, the conclusion. My next episode is, um, we haven't had any matchups so far. So I'm, yeah, that's good. I'm kind of curious. Do you have on your list Chain of Command? I do not. You do not. I All do right. not. I respect it. I like it. But it's not in my rewatchability. That's fair. But I think it's, I think it's got some things that are interesting to talk about. Absolutely. Which is, which is why I bring it up. Uh, this is, this is the famous "There Are Four Lights" episode of of the Next Generation, where uh, Picard is pulled from command of the Enterprise. He's he's pulled out of the captain's chair by by uh, Admiral Bicheyev because they want Picard to go on a secret mission in Cardassian space. Starfleet intelligence believes that the Cardassians are developing a metagenic weapon. Oh my God. And they need Picard, because he's got some knowledge on the subject, to go check this out. So they pull him from command, and then they bring in the villain from RoboCop, uh, com uh, Commander Jello Cap Captain Jellico, to take over the Enterprise. Presumably permanently. Mm -hmm. It's not necessary to give Captain Jellico command of the Enterprise just to conduct a negotiation. The Enterprise will be in a dangerous situation, and I want someone on the bridge who has a great deal of experience with the Cardassians. No offense, Commander, but... That's not you. And so then uh, Picard goes on his mission with Crusher and Worf, and it's a trap. The Cardassians, those evil Cardassians, have set a trap to capture Picard, to, to extract knowledge from him. Well, it's a good thing they didn't send uh, three nobody Starfleet security guards to go on this mission. <laughs> so they're the captain of the flagship. You know what, it would be a lamer episode if it were just a red shirt being tortured. Well, th that's why they, you send a 20-year-old Bajoran girl into Cardassian space on a secret mission, <laughs> because they don't come back. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Picard is captured. Uh, Picard is tortured, and it's two-parter about torture. I don't enjoy this, but I must demonstrate. It will make everything clearer. <laughs> I think it's David Warner. Yeah, plays the Cardassian. Yeah, the, the British, famous uh, British character actor. He's in Star Trek VI: The Undiscovered Country. Star Trek VI. He was the villain in Tron, but he he tortures Picard and interrogates him, and basically he can't get any information out of Picard, and at some point he knows that Picard doesn't have any useful information for him, but he just wants to break Picard for the sake of breaking him. I've just received word. There's been a battle. The Enterprise is burning in space. The invasion of Minos Corva has been successful. He just wants Picard to admit there are five lights when there are, in, they are, there are in fact four. Tell me how many lights you see. He wants to dominate him. He wants to, he wants to utterly dominate him. And he completely, you know, just completely dehumanizes Picard. He, he like, you know, his like daughter comes in the room at some point and like, oh yeah, how you doing? And didn't even care that his daughter is witnessing this, yeah. this man being horrifically tortured. Because Picard doesn't, he's just a piece of meat. But human mothers and fathers don't love their children as we do. They're not the same as we are. The torturer, David Warner's character, from what I recall, is it's all status for them, but on the inside, they're the weakling. They're the scared one. I think from what I recall... Well, that happens in the episode. Picard a... breaks him, basically, because they, they say, you've gone far enough, David Warner. Well, he, ad he admits something that happened when he was a child that... That, that, that scared him. Oh no, no, this is why he's like explaining why the, the military is good because before the military took over Cardassia, everyone was starving and things were terrible. And I was, I was just a scared little boy. And then Picard points out, yeah, that's, all I'll, that's all I'll ever see when I look at you now. You're just a scared little boy. Whenever I look at you now, I won't see a powerful Cardassian warrior. I will see a six year old boy who is powerless to protect himself. Be quiet. Lashing out. Yeah, yeah. Just infuriates him even more. Right, right. In spite of all you've done to me, I find you a pitiable man. 
Picard. Stop it. Captain Jellicoe takes over and he is not laid back at all. It's like, things are gonna be done like this. I want four shifts. You gotta get these shifts ready. I want them ready four minutes ago. And we're gonna work extra twice as hard. And everybody on the Enterprise is used to the, basically the Enterprise, like before then, it's just like a luxury cruise liner. Everyone just hanging out in bar and doing jazz and, and suddenly there's this harsh taskmaster in charge. But I, I, I think what's interesting about it to me is normally, and normally in like a Star Trek episode when the new authority figure comes in, it's usually, it's usually an admiral, but they're always like the bad guy. Yeah. They're always evil and our, our heroes have to take charge back from this commander who's just, they're off their gourd and they're doing terrible the, things. The, but the Doomsday Machine episode of TOS. That's the classic one. The yeah. Admiral's nuts and he's putting everyone in danger because he's just gone bonkers. But, but it's a twist with Jellico. Chain of Command completely subverts that because everything that Captain Jellico does is fucking right. Mr. Worf. Prepare to detonate. I will agree to your terms. Excellent. This episode makes Riker look like such a fucking asshole. Because he, he butts heads specifically with Riker. Let's drop the ranks for a moment. I don't like you. I think you're insubordinate, arrogant, willful. And I don't think you're a particularly good first officer. And Riker just comes off looking like this petulant brat. Well... Now that the ranks are dropped, Captain, I don't like you either. You are arrogant and closed-minded. You need to control everything and everyone. But, but the truth is that Captain Jellico knows exactly how to handle the Cardassians. He knows, he knows when to bluff, how to bluff. We got him in the nebula, we got him right where we want him, we're gonna do this. And the sad thing of that episode is when Captain Jellico has to come to Riker, because Riker is the best pilot on the ship and they need a good pilot to lay the mines around the nebula. And he basically has to beg Riker to do his fucking job. Will you pilot the shuttle, Commander? Yes. You're welcome. It's just, it's just a very interesting choice that they didn't make Jellico the villain. And I'm wondering why they did that if they just didn't want to just shake up what we normally do with the evil admiral. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know what the thinking was behind it. Yeah, normally it would be uh, like a conventional, more conventional storyline would be Jellicoe's gone power mad because he has the flagship and he's just blowing everybody up. Riker, oh no, what Jellicoe's doing is going to start a war. We have to, Captain, uh, Commander Riker has to find a way to stop him from right, really right, ruining Worf, this situation. Remove ca com Captain Jellicoe from the bridge. I'm taking over. We're leaving this situation and we're going to rescue Picard. Yeah. Um, but doesn't where they let Picard go, Jellico solves the problem, and well, Riker realizes that uh, there are different ways to do things. The salt in the wound is that Jellico, Jellico even manages to save Picard. I understand you're holding a Starfleet officer named Jean-Luc Picard. I expect him returned immediately. Even though he he doesn't know, we gotta we gotta let Picard die. I mean, even 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 after that, he still manages to save Picard. It is a shame he never came back. The other thing I wonder about this episode, why wasn't this the cliffhanger for season six? The cliffhanger for season six was fucking Descent. Yeah. Probably one of the worst TNG episodes or stories. And this would have been such a good uh, cliffhanger because it, it, similar to Best of Both Worlds, it, it, it leaves the question open as to whether or not they're gonna shake up the status quo. Yeah. Like, maybe they are shaping up Jellico to be the new captain. Maybe we won't see Picard again. I think they had a, a cliffhanger problem, six and seven-ish, because they also had Picard gets kidnapped and turned into a mercenary two-parter. <laughs> I think that was supposed to be the six and seven two-parter. And then they said, let's do Descent, and let's just put this in as a two-parter. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, think, I think there was a lot of... Uh, we don't have, we need, we need something that's really good. What do we got? Yeah. You were right, Talera. The resonator cannot be stopped by phases and shields. Number four, this is an official 
uh, guilty pleasure episode. It is called Disaster. Oh God, that's a very guilt. Wait, no, wait. No, that one's fine. I, I was. I thought you were talking about the episode that was um, Die Hard on the Enterprise. No, no, no. That's a guilty <laughs> pleasure and a half. That episode. That's okay. I love Disaster. Tapestry was Quantum Leap. Disaster is more or less the Poseidon adventure in space. Yeah. It's patterned after a classic disaster movie. Yeah. It's like the 70s. Right, exactly. Like Poseidon Adventure or Towering Inferno or movies like that. Uh, there's personal drama, there's action, ship tech stuff, and teamwork. Conflict. Conflict, yes. Um, so, so the episode starts off with Picard. This is an, uh, kind of a famous Picard episode because he's trapped in an elevator with three children. Well then, um... This one starts off on the bridge. O'Brien's there, Troy's there. Um, uh, there's a lieutenant lady who's like the highest rank. She's because like Miles O'Brien has like no rank. Always good to meet another chief petty officer, Sergei Rajenko, formerly of the USS Intrepid. Miles Edward O'Brien, sir. Good to meet you. He's the transporter technician. Yes. And so Picard leaves the bridge with three kids who won the science fair contest and gets on the turbo lift, and they run into a quantum filament, some sort of space anomaly that fucks the ship up royally. Um, so you have a wonderful little action scene where everything's like shaking and exploding. And um, you have, I think, is it four or five different scenarios of survival in different parts of the ship where there's, there's interpersonal drama and conflict. Most importantly, bridge, 10 forward, Picard in the turbo lift, and then Riker and Data trying to stop the ship from blowing up. And uh, I just, I love it. It's fun, it's adventurous. Oh, and um, uh, uh, Beverly Crusher and Jordy LaForge in the cargo bay. So, th so there's all these great little moments in it. And, you know, it's not the most thought-provoking episode. It doesn't deal with ethics or, you know, it's just a fun disaster episode that, that has a lot, lot of nice little details. Yeah. Um, and as I rewatched it, I really enjoyed kind of picking up on more details. Uh, you start off with, you know, Troy's on the bridge, and, and I wanted to mention, you talked about chain of command. Yeah. After that, she started wearing a proper uniform, because uh, Jellico gave her a dressing down. Yes, he yelled at her. He's like, why are you wearing that? I prefer a certain formality on the bridge. I'd appreciate it if you wore a standard uniform when you're on duty. Um, and but on a fucking uniform. And yeah, and eventually Troy takes a test to become uh, a commander because in this she carries the rank of lieutenant commander and she doesn't even know it. <laughs> uh, Miles O'Brien mansplains her own rank to her. I believe Counselor Troy is the senior officer on the deck. Counselor Troy? She carries the rank of lieutenant commander because she's in command of the Enterprise. She's the, the ranking officer on the bridge. And um, so her situation is she's in command and she's got the Miles O'Brien, the by the numbers, by the books guy. And she's got the wild card, Ensign Rowe, former terrorist. Who just who, wants to let everybody blow up. Who's like, fucking separate <laughs> the ship. The, 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 the other half of the ship's gonna blow up. Fuck those people. But that's damn cold blooded. What about the people down there? There's no evidence that anyone is still alive in the drive section. No evidence they're dead either. She diverts power from the phasers into the bridge terminal, like, and O'Brien's like, what are you doing? That, that's dangerous. I diverted power from the phaser array, and I dumped it into the engineering control system. You what? There's this wonderful part, because this is the, the, the episode where Worf delivers Keiko O'Brien's baby in 10 Forward. And it's, it's a humorous, lighthearted scene. You know, he's like, he did the simulation. He's like, all right, no. The baby should be coming out now. You know, and she's like, it doesn't work that way, Wolf. 
but in the beginning, Keiko's standing there and she's like, here's my baby, you know? And Riker's like, oh, you should name him William after me. And, and Data's like, uh, can I touch the belly? Everybody's interested in the baby. But the way the shot is framed, Worf is standing there with his arms folded, like just looking elsewhere. He has no interest whatsoever. <laughs> he does not give a shit. And so as fate would have it, he's the one who delivers the baby in a matter of hours. So it's this wonderful little touch. And then you have, and this is probably me reading in way too much, but you have um, uh, Beverly Crusher nagging Geordi to, to be in her play. He's like, I, I don't sing. I don't like doing this. I don't want to do it. Leave me alone. I'm working. And she's like, come on. Um, so I like the little touch of everyday life on the Enterprise. You know, Beverly Crusher's always trying to do plays. She's bored. Um, <laughs> but it turns out Geordi's, Geordi's hesitant to do an activity that involves singing, which is lungs. I am the very model of a modern major general. I have information, vegetable, animal, and mineral. No, I, I can't. I can't do yes, this. Yes, you can. I cannot sing in front of people. You were terrific. Breath. Breathing capacity. Oh my God, you're right. You're right, that's perfect. Who's the first that passes out <laughs> when they're run out, run out of oxygen, right? Yeah. Jordy, who's the one who makes it over the control panel? Beverly Crusher, who also is a skilled tap dancer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she tap dances her way over to the control panel and can still maintain breath because she exercises her lungs in her place. So their character flaws are showed during, during that. I'm like, oh yeah, she made, she made it over there. She's good on her feet. She's the dancing doctor, as they say, right? That, 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 that was a little character arc for Jordy to maybe try singing a little more. He doesn't have the best lung capacity. Uh, but their, their problem is they have a, a plasma fire and then they have big canisters of rocket or jetpack fuel. The porotum in those containers is used in emergency thruster packs. It's normally pretty stable stuff, but when you expose porotum to radiation, as a way of exploding. That, that are just in the cargo bay. And it's, just, so it's, it's neat. We, like, we don't know what's in those canisters. And so it's like, and then Picard, Picard's like, okay, you know, we gotta get some cabling. Uh, okay, little girl, hit, hit two buttons, then hit the button below it, right? and that'll release the panel. Like all those little like tiny technical details, like Picard knows, all these Starfleet officers know which buttons to hit that'll make these things happen. <laughs> They've memorized it all, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And that makes the control panel come out music, pull out all the optical cabling. We're gonna use that as a rope. Um, so the guts of the ship, all the details, all those like wonderful things that you don't see in Discovery. Everyone's yelling and, and exploding things. <laughs> And it's just, it's just that, that kind of stuff that I like, the, the personal drama. You can't let wishful thinking guide your decision, Counselor. It's time to leave. We will separate the ship when I decide that it's time and not before. Is that clear, Ensign? The action-adventure element of it, the survival, how do we survive this situation, and, and technical stuff. Because then Riker and, and Data have to get to engineering. And Riker take Data's head with him at some point? Yes, yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's an electrical beam that they need, so they need to break the circuit on, so they need a non-conductive material, and Data's like, that's my body. You could take off my head and bring it to engineering. You want me to take off your head? Yes, sir. And we'll figure out what the problem, problem is. So it's like a bunch of wild stuff happening in this episode. That's, that's a quality pick. I haven't thought about that episode in a while, but that's a quality pick. Yeah. Characters doing things that are out of their wheelhouse. Yeah, yeah. 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 Troy, uh, Troy is thrust into the command chair. And, and you she's, know. She, in her mind, she's just there to be the counselor. Never, yeah. never, never thought she'd have to be in a, ma never thought she'd ever have to make a command decision. Uh, so she's asking about the quantum filament and Miles O'Brien explains it. And she's like, so it's like a cosmic string? And he's like, he's like, no. No, that's a completely different phenomenon. That's an entirely different <laughs> phenomenon. <laughs> And then, um, and then, this is purely for the audience's sake, because Riker's not there. Uh -huh. We've got a problem. To ask dumb questions, but, <laughs> you know, uh, they're talking about having a containment breach in engineering. And, and Troy's like, what will happen then? 
If it falls to 15%, the field will collapse. And we'll have a containment breach. Which means? <laughs> and and, and uh, Rose's like, the ship will explode. Which means the ship will explode. <laughs> you know, that's totally for the sake of the audience, but I think everybody in Starfleet should understand what a warp core breach is. A containment breach. Yeah. Even those little kids in the, in the elevator shaft understand what a containment breach means. <laughs> um, I see. That's very, very commendable. Troy has a problem, you know. She has a, a decision to make. No one's in engineering. The, con the containment field is failing. If it gets down beneath 15%, the ship will blow up. Is anyone alive down there even? Who knows? Why don't we separate the ship? At least the people in the saucer section will be okay. They don't men make mention on how, the, how they're gonna get away. I don't think the impulse engines were working. Whatever. <laughs> um, uh, and then Troy's like, no, you know, I gotta make the call. Let's hold out. Let's see if we can get some power down there to the, the terminals. You know, everybody kind of, even though they're all in different parts of the ship, they all find a way to work together, get out of their own little situation. It's, it's, it's the Poseidon adventure in space. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's just wonderful. I just, it's just a rewatchable, rewatchable episode. It's a quality pick. I haven't, I haven't, I didn't even think to rewatch that one. I just haven't thought about that episode in a while, but no, you're reminding me of it. That's a, yeah. that's a good episode. It, it falls in line with uh, kind of that, um, uh, one where the Enterprise keeps blowing up over and over again. Speaking of the one where the Enterprise keeps blowing up over and over again. Take it away, Rich. My, my fourth pick is cause and effect, which, which in my eyes is the, the ultimate space anomaly episode. Yeah, yeah. Cause and Effect is a, a wonderful uh, time loop episode where at the beginning of the episode, quite shockingly, the first thing that happens is the fucking Enterprise just blows up and everyone is on the bridge panicking. Just... All hands abandon the ship! Repeat! All hands abandon! I saw that live on TV <laughs> and I ran to tell my mom. <laughs> I said, Mom, the Enterprise just blew up! And she's just, she gave two shits. And then we, we have the credits. And then after the credits, everything is just normal. We, I, is, I, I think the first thing we see is like the poker game. Is that the first thing we see? It's like the, the uh, running, one of the running things through TNG was that Riker hosts poker games every, every week. And they're just, they're just playing poker and they have some like, Vague feelings of deja vu. Um, Jordy goes to the sick bay. He's got a problem with a was it a headache or his visor? Yeah, yeah. And then um, you have come. The crush is like, have you come in for this before? He's like, nah, I don't think so. Something wrong, Mr. Worf. I am experiencing nippa. The feeling I've done this before. I've been having the same feeling. Wait. And then the ship blows up again. And then they're playing poker again. And they're having more deja. And this, this loop just keeps continue, continuing where they go through the same day over and over again, only just every time there's an increasing feeling of deja vu to the point where they realize something is wrong and they don't know what. And it just, I just love the way in this episode they have to just figure out what's going on when their memory basically just gets erased every time they go through it. It's all because uh, Kelsey Grammer crashed his ship into the <laughs> Well, that's, that's a weird as aspect of this episode. Just Kelsey Grammer comes in out of nowhere on a 100-year-old starship. He's, he was stuck in the loop, too. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how he didn't figure it out after 100-plus years, but it was, it was a wonderful cameo. Kelsey Grammer says, I want to be in Star Trek. You get, that, you get that a lot in Star Trek. A lot of people are Trekkies and they just want to show up in some form. Yeah. Christian Slater is in... Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered six? Country. Yeah. Mick Fleetwood, the drummer, Fleetwood oh. Mac. Oh, yeah, yeah. Was he, was he at? You'll never even guess. Oh, my God, is he under, like, some bizarre alien makeup? He's, you, do you remember the, the, the fish people that had to be stuck in those, <laughs> those tanks of salt? That's Fleetwood Mac? Yeah. Well, it's not the whole band. Yeah. It's just Mick Fleetwood. Uh, Iggy Pop appears in um, Deep Space Nine as a, a Vorta. 
Perhaps one day, the Ferengi will take their place as valued members of the Dominion. Anything's possible. Whoopi Goldberg, that was basically, a, I'm a fan, I want to be in it. It was a bit more than a cameo. I mean, they give her a fucking part. But... Stephen Hawking. Yeah, Holo Holo hologram Stephen Hawking. I don't, I don't have much else special to say about her other than it just, for a classic, it's just a really well done classic space anomaly episode. Yeah, I, I really like the, the, the visual effects too. There's some, like, the visual effects just got so good towards the end. Like, like you have, like, the Naked Now episode uh, where they all, they all get the drunk disease. Yeah, yeah. And then Wesley Crusher uses the tractor beam to push the asteroid into the ship. So it blows Fuck up. Wesley Crusher. And it, look, it looks so bad, but this, like, when that Miranda-class ship comes out of the... The spatial it's, it's, anomaly. The time anomaly, yeah. Scrapes up against the, the warp nacelle and just blows up. I mean, it's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. Those models and the effects later on were awesome. My favorite TNG episode of all time is the Beverly Crusher Harlequin romance novel episode. Emily. You prick. I'm just kidding. You lying this. prick. Okay, so th this is a deep cut and, it, and uh, it's my favorite one, because we haven't mentioned one of our favorite characters, Lieutenant Reginald oh. Barkley. It's the nth degree. Which Barkley episode was that? It is the one where Barkley becomes the smartest human being who ever, ever existed. <laughs> Lieutenant, you could very well be the most advanced human being who has ever lived. It's all Barkley all the time and it's 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 just a wonderful little character episode that has that has humor action uh an interesting sci-fi premise now now for, for for people who don't know star trek who is barkley and why is he special i guess the question is whether mr barkley is enterprise material Barkley is a man who, who lives in the 24th century and apparently they have not found a cure for Asperger's. <laughs> um, he, he is a, a, a smart, competent Starfleet officer, but he's incredibly socially awkward. Your preliminary report had a couple of interesting theories, Reg. And nervous. Why don't you bring us all up to speed on your findings so far? Yes. It, it, it wasn't a maintenance problem. And, and I guess there's no medication for that either <laughs> in the 24th century. You can't take an antidepressant or some Valium or something. Uh, he, he previously had a holodeck addiction uh, because he, he hated his normal life, so he escaped to the holodeck. Uh, oh. Riker, you're nothing but a pretty mannequin in a fancy uniform. You're full of hot air. Picard has a problem with me. You tell him to come and talk to me himself. Where he, he like punches Riker and he sleeps with the women on, uh, of the Starship Enterprise and he becomes addicted to the holodeck. Um, but he's, he's, he's an awkward guy and nobody likes him, except for Jordy kind of tolerates him. It's a wonderful contrast, like everybody else you ever see on Star Trek because yeah. every character on Star Trek is just confident and smart and intelligent and professional. No, no, sir. We'll have to shut off some systems. We'll uh, shut them down a few at a time. It shouldn't, uh, I don't think so. Barkley, it works with Barkley because he's such a contrast to yeah. that. And, and that's why a lot of times side characters to me, even in Next Gen, are more interesting. Because uh, you had that kind of clumsy Sonia Gomez character and that, you know, oh, she spills the coffee, spill on, Picard. coffee on Picard. <gasps> oh, no! Oh, I'm sorry, 
Sorry. Oh, Captain. Um, you have Guinan. Um, you know, there, there's characters that are not. There are either are Starfleet or aren't. They're they're interesting because they have quirks. Like Riker to me is dull. Jordy's a little dull. Crusher's dull. I think I think Riker only exists because they wanted to back up Kirk. Yeah. If their experiment with the weird bald diplomat didn't work, <laughs> we've got Kirk 2.0 waiting in the wings. The the, the hotshot ladies man who runs around yeah. and yeah, punches people. Yeah. No, I know that. I, I'm well aware of that. But yeah, uh, Barkley is is you know off the charts, and it and it starts with. It opens with Barclay is in one of Dr. Crusher's plays, Cyrano de Bergerac, where he is fumbling his way through his performance. He's terrible, he's, he keeps fucking up, forgetting his lines, and everyone's just like uncomfortable. Ah. He does not know. Ah. Not yet. But he is proud, noble, brave. You know, and he's, he's just, he's, just, he's a fuck up. He's a royal fuck up. And then, they have to go fix the Argus array. Is that where you get the uh, data? Why is everybody clapping? Yes. <laughs> because yes. it's polite data. Yeah. Lieutenant Barclay's performance was adequate, but clearly not rooted in the method approach. I do not understand why. data. Because it's polite. Because it's polite. Like Worf and Jordy like side eye each other. <laughs> like, oh my God. And then the plot starts the, the Argus array is this giant space array that sends communications around and there's, it's gonna blow up basically, and they, they don't know, they got to try to fix it. Uh, Jordy and Barkley go out in a shuttlecraft to take a look, and there's a weird space probe there floating around, and it sends a blast of energy. It doesn't get into Jordy's brain because he has, he's blind and he has his thing, but it, it gets into Barkley's brain, and then he changes. Little things, little things start building up. The, the big first thing is an action scene. The probe is following. Options number one. We can't use photon torpedoes. An explosion this close could cripple us. The Enterprise uh, is being attacked and chased by the space probe. Do you remember this? <sighs> Vaguely. So it's one of my favorite shots of the Enterprise. I remember the ending, clearly. Yeah, the, the Enterprise does a full about and it kind of turns and leaves. It's one of my favorite shots of, of the Enterprise D. And uh, Worf's just like, eh, phasers, phasers, nothing's working. We, we got to hit it with 10 photon torpedoes, but it's so close, the blast is going to blow us up too. And then basically Barkley just says, get out of the way, Jordy. I'm just going to do this myself. I can enhance the shield by 10 times their strength. You know, he basically saves the ship. And Jordy's like, I don't know how the hell he did that. <laughs> And then, so you have this great performance from uh, Dwight Schultz, uh, the A-Team guy, yeah. where he has to play clumsy, awkward, bad actor, but then... What the devil is he doing there among us? Philosopher, scientist, poet, musician, duelist, here lies Hercule Savignan, the Cyrano de Bergerac. He does the scene from uh, Cyrano, and he moves Dr. Crusher to tears with his acting. It's not the perfect parallel for the TNG episode, um, story-wise, but it, it is a nice little framing device because in the, the Cyrano de Bergerac play, uh, you know, he's an ugly guy with a big nose and um, he's, he's smart and, you know, thoughtful on the inside, but on the outside he's ugly. And then there's this other guy, Christiane, I think, who's, who's kind of more handsome and he's, he's wooing this lady. Um, but Cyrano de Bergerac's writing the letters for him and she's impressed by his, his mind and his thoughts, but she doesn't know it's the ugly guy writing the letters. The, the whole episode reminds me of a story called Flowers for, I think, Flowers for Elgeron, I think is the name of the story, but basically they, they do this uh, scientific experiment on this man who's kind of slow, he's not very intelligent, and they do this experiment and suddenly he's, he's super smart and confident and suave and good with the ladies. And it just reminds me of that story. Yeah. Ever since our running with that probe, something's different about you. What? Because I'm beginning to behave like the rest of the crew with confidence in what I'm doing? Uh, so they say his IQ is like 1400 or some 1200 to 1400, somewhere in that range. She's like, you're the smartest human being who's ever lived. <laughs> um. So it's not just raw intelligence we're talking about here. No, 
creativity, resourcefulness, inspiration, imagination, they've all been enhanced. And yeah, so then he saves the Argus Array, he figures out a way to fix it quickly. Um, he's just blowing past everybody. They're worried about him, you know, but then Picard's like, is there any danger, you know? That approach would require much more time than our original plan, at least seven weeks. I could have it ready for you in two days. What? His brain works so fast, he can't use the computer interfaces. So he has to create like this, this, this throne room chair in the holodeck where he could like interact directly with the computer via his brain, through lasers through his brain. And he basically becomes the Enterprise. He basically becomes the Enterprise computer. So he goes out of control and Picard's like, okay, I, uh, we can't, if we disconnect him from that, he'll die. And Picard's like, do it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't have a crazy man running my ship, right? Uh -huh. um, and then, so the, the whole premise is that a highly advanced space alien from the other side of the galaxy doesn't go out exploring, they bring people to them via this technology that makes everyone so smart, they take control of the ship, bring it, bring it out there. It's the most inefficient way to study the galaxy. Yeah, I think it's pretty efficient. <laughs> bring them to you. <laughs> so it has the you know, seek out new life, new civilizations. They have a nice first contact with this alien. Uh, and then he gets brought back to his normal self after the, after the, uh, the whole adventure is over. How do you feel now? Smaller, just plain old Barkley, huh? And then at the very end, there's a little, little cute sitcom ending where he walks past the chessboard, you know? Oh. And he, he moves a chess piece and he's like, checkmate, Nate moves. I think it's Troy who says, I didn't know you play chess. And he's like, I don't. <laughs> um, that's, that's almost a guilty pleasure. The episode is not like the best episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. I mean, it is on my list. But it's your favorite. It's one of my favorites. I, it's hard to pick a favorite. It's, I would say it's, it could be tied with a couple others, I'm not sure, but really, I really love it because it, it, it checks all these boxes to me. Uh, I love the leisure time on the Enterprise where they, they, they socialize and they have plays and poetry readings. And, and then, you know, you got that ending where Worf is, and, and the security guards are trying to blow him up with phasers. And it's just ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculously fun science, a science fiction episode. And it has a great performance by Dwight Schultz where he goes, he transforms into another, another character. I would be sad if none of our top fives had a Barkley episode. So I'm, I'm glad you picked that one. And, and a lot of your top fives are mine too. It, like you said, it's very hard it's to pick top five. Very hard. You must trust me. Okay, so, so similar to you, I think, my, my favorite all-time episode of Star Trek is, is not one of your obvious choices, like your, your inner lights or your chain of command, best of both worlds. My favorite episode of Star Trek is probably most people think is pretty standard episode, but considering I like standard Star Trek, that's probably not too shocking. It is Who Watches the Watchers, which is uh, an episode where um, there is this outpost on a planet that is studying uh, these proto-Vulcans. They're, they're this alien race. They're, they're still pretty primitive. They're like Bronze Age, Stone Age, not a little over Stone Age, but they're not very advanced. They don't know anything about space travel, and uh, some Federation uh, anthropologists are are studying them. They've got this this holographic projector that's covering up this this little watchtower base they've got in this little rock, rocky hill area, but but it's malfunctioning. It, it it needs this you know engineering assistance from the Enterprise to get the hollow projectors back on, or else the locals will see it and uh, the Enterprise doesn't get there in time. We're on our way. In fact, there's an explosion, and um, some of the locals on this primitive planet, they see this strange phenomena going, going on. What's, what's that? Because you know, they don't know shit about holographic projectors. They know bows and arrows and, and whatnot. And so they, they go over to investigate it, and they see what to them is is magic. They, 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 they see Captain Picard with his, this alien with a Starfleet uniform on, you know, directing things, and they're, they're using this fantastic technology to beam people away. And um, basically, there's cultural contamination, and now this, 
this this race now starts to believe in Picard as a literal god. Nuria, I'm not saying that all the old beliefs are true. But I did see the Picard. And I was restored back to life. It just, it's, a, it's a good ethical dilemma episode, and it's also a good um, prime directive episode. Well, I was going to say that. We haven't had a prime directive episode. That each of us, including Dr. Palmer, took an oath that we would uphold the prime directive if necessary, with our lives. This is, this is my, the, the best Prime Directive episode, in my opinion. Uh, the Prime Directive, if you don't know anything about Star Trek, is basically they have, Starfleet has a no interference policy with, if, you, if, you're, if you're an alien race and you, you haven't gotten out into space yet, it is forbidden to, to visit that planet. And this episode is basically why that policy is in place. Not just to visit the planet, because you could do that in secret to, to observe, but to yeah. interfere. To interfere. Interfere with the natural progression of the society uh, or the planet, because I think there, uh, th there was the, the Pen Pals episode where they were debating whether or not to rescue the little girl mm -hmm. and her family. What we do today may profoundly affect the future. And, and to stop the volcanoes from going off because they're like, okay, well, all these volcanoes are gonna kill everyone on the planet. Well, like, Is it really interference if they're all gonna die if we do nothing? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the way it's gotta go. Well, what are you proposing? If we can determine the cause of these geological disturbances, we might be able to reverse the process. Violate the prime directive? But yeah, where it's like a civilization is, is so primitive and there's some kind of disease or you can't just go down and cure the disease and leave. She's going to die. They're all going to die. Unless. Yes, unless. Because that's the natural progression of their society. Their, you know, their culture might have died out. It could create warp drive at some point. That's really the, I think that's the big, the big thing is once you create warp drive, that's when. Yeah, well, that's when you're you're gonna run into other species anyway. You're officially so it's, it's on the map. Finally, time to just show up and give everybody a briefing, which is another one of my favorite episodes. Didn't quite make the list. First contact. The the other first contact. Yes, Riker is is found out as a secret alien. Yeah. Your arrival will change our entire understanding of life. Some will not want it to change. Also, a slight nod to a, kind of a, a funner episode when Data, Data crash lands and gets covered in, in radiation. <laughs> and he just wanders into a, a primitive town and goes, Mwah! And he forgets who the fuck he is, and he and starts he, telling them things. He gives everybody radiation poisoning. Yes, yes. <laughs> Lots the, of good Star Trek. I, I love when he interferes with the ladies' class. She's like, everything comes from the three elements, fire, wood, and water. <laughs> I do not believe that is correct. Oh? I believe you are reasoning by analogy, classifying objects and phenomena according to superficial observation rather than empirical evidence. Actually, everything you're teaching them is wrong. They, they, yeah, he's, he's irradiating the whole town and they're like, oh boy, they show up. <laughs> Accidental Prime Directive yeah. mishaps are a lot, of, a lot of fun episodes. And this is certainly a classic one. This is a classic one. Um, also, uh, it's fun just seeing the like races uh, meet Starfleet for the first time. Like, like you get to see aliens from the aliens' perspective in a way, like, you know? Yeah. Because we are the aliens visiting them. Yeah. And that's, that's always, that's, that's fun when that happens on these shows. Something, something else I like about this episode, it's, it's refreshing to me that Star Trek has, puts, it, Star Trek puts no value in the concept of faith. Star Trek is all about reason and, and, and rationality triumphing. And like, like this episode illustrates that because uh, the, the, the thing in this episode is like, oh my God, we've given these people a belief system. We have to fix this grievous error at any cost. We have a problem, the contamination. It's worse than we suspected. The Mentakans are beginning to believe in a God. And the one they've chosen is you. And that's fun to me. 
Mm. They don't just, you mean they don't just leave? Yeah, they don't just leave. <laughs> it's like, well, they believe in something now. And... Uh, you mean they just don't skip skip town like <laughs> like Luke Skywalker and Han Solo did? Forever no. altering the Ewok uh, <laughs> culture? <laughs> As they, thousands of years later, there are statues of, of C-3PO on a cross. But Picard is willing to give his own life to stop these people from believing in something. Yeah. Yeah, he gets shot with an arrow. Yeah. But if the only proof you will believe is my death, then shoot. Lingo, don't do it! Father, no! He proves to them that he is human. Do they wipe their memories at the end? I don't remember. No, that's pen pals. Yeah. This one, they, they reference pen pals. They try to wipe the memory of the guy who saw Picard, yeah. and it just doesn't work. Oh, okay. the brain's too different. Eventually, someday. Well, eventually, what, what happens is Picard takes the, like, the, the, I don't know if she's a tribal leader, but one of their, one of their higher-ups in their culture up to the starship, yes, yes. and he just wants to explain to her, he's trying to explain to this person what, what like, technology is. Like, no, this, none of this is magic. Mm-hmm. Because they, they, keep, they keep wanting, like, Picard, like, can you bring back our dead? Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. So he eventually takes her to the sick bay where one of the um, anthropologists dies from the wounds when the, the base exploded. And he's like, oh, yeah, I, yeah. I can't bring back. That's right. That's right. It's been a while since I've seen this one. He has a, he has a good little speech where he's like, oh, in your past, people used to live in caves, right? Well, yes. They live in houses now. Uh, this is, things progress. It's not a mind-blowing episode. It's not an epic episode. It's a, it's a standard Star Trek TNG episode in, that, in that, that golden era of like seasons three through five where like almost every episode was perfect. Yeah. And it just, it just it represents all of that to me, that it's episode. A, it's an encapsulating episode. Yeah. It's a figurehead episode. Pr prime directive, ethics. Yeah. Aliens, magic. Non-violent non, non problem-solving. That's, uh, yeah, I, 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 I like Who Watches the Watchers as well. They, they, they redo that, uh, that secret... Um, uh, insurrection. Insurrection, the secretly hidden observation window in Insurrection. But yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a handful of uh, episodes like that where they uh, infiltrate an emerging alien culture yeah. to, to study them, and then they get caught. Then there's a, a couple of reverses where alien, advanced alien cultures infiltrate them. <laughs> it's, it's basically it's the opposite of what Kirk would have done in the original series. I remember an episode of Star Trek, the original series, where they, they're, they're dealing with a, a primitive culture that doesn't have space travel, and Kirk like starts reading them the Constitution of the United States. <laughs> We the people, this document says, we the people. <laughs> you can get away with that shit back then. Yeah, 1960s, sure. <laughs> Picard is a, was a better diplomat than, uh, than Captain Kirk. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. He was the cowboy. Yeah. Picard was the diplomat. That's a lot of TNG talk, Rich. Oh, God, yeah. We had, you know what the shocking thing is? We didn't have one overlap. I know, that's weird. Weird. That's weird. We both like our... You, you didn't really have any too, too many guilty pleasures. Not really. No. It's not that I... There's pro, it's not like I don't like these episodes. Like, like I, 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 this list might even change if I had the time to sort through and rewatch every episode sure. properly. Sure. I would consider cause and effect kind of a guilty pleasure episode. It's not really yeah. like, like a big thinker, but it's fun. Yeah. And it's neat. But yeah, we, you got you, you got to have your prime directive. You got to have your Picard speech episodes. You got to have your your, your lighthearted episode. You know where uh, uh, neither of us apparently like the Klingon crap. Uh, no, those are like the Worf episodes. I don't want to say I hate the Klingon politics episodes, but I'm never I'm never delighted when that. Like, when I turned on the TV back before I could just watch whatever episode I wanted, and it was a Worf episode. It was like. Okay. Yeah. And neither of us uh, seem too keen on very specific Data episodes either, other than me Measure of a Man, but... Data's an interesting character. He's also kind of creepy. I would not participate in a murder. Remember in Descent, Data got emotions and he decided he was going to kill all of his friends. 
it's a little creepy. Then he put that emotions chip back in on Star Trek Generations and went fucking nuts. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, though, what what came damn close to being on my list was uh, was it the most toys? Yes. That's a great episode. Which I guess bonus episode. <laughs> it's it's a it's similar in vain to Measure of the Man. Is data property or yeah. a, a creature? But that guy didn't give a shit. Maybe maybe we'll talk about that next time. Yeah. Yeah. There are our top five episodes. We could easily make a top ten. We could, we could uh, continue this ride. I think 10. Ten's a bit much. Yeah, 10, ten's a bit much for one show. Doing another uh, five, I'd be down, five down total, for it. Five yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Just pick five more that you really like that are in your top, top 10. We can talk about them someday soon after coronavirus is over. <laughs> if it's ever over, Mike. <laughs> um, but we always have our Star Trek. Uh, on Blu-ray, and we'll always have our Star Trek phaser props to play with. Ah! Till next time on Review. It is over.